God announces the end for Judah and Jerusalem, ushering Ezekiel into the answer to the question, why? Exposing Ezekiel to the abominations occurring in and around the temple. And James, the blood brother of Jesus, writes a letter. Today on 3 and 1, as we consider Ezekiel chapter 7 through 9 and James chapter 1. Well, if there was any doubt about whether or not God was done with Judah and Jerusalem at this point in their history, chapter 7 of Ezekiel wiped that all away. Over and over again, in almost every way imaginable, God proclaimed through the prophet that judgment was imminent for Judah and Jerusalem. Now, even though this had been coming for 490 years and the people of God had the opportunity to repent that entire time, there would still be that tendency on our part to wonder, why, God, is this really necessary? Is it really that bad that you have to allow this kind of judgment? So then, there is God's answer in chapter 8. A, a vision, almost more than a vision, a, a transportation if that's even a word. God grips the prophet by the hair and pulls him up and sets him down right next to the temple in Jerusalem. Starting at the outer edge, as the prophet observes the obvious abominations, and then God basically says over and over again as he approaches the center, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Go a bit deeper. And and with each approach closer and closer to what was supposed to be the Holy of Holies, the prophet observed increasing levels and layers of sin and abominations committed by those who were not only supposed to be committed to God, but who were also charged with the responsibility to lead others to be committed to God. And yet they were committed to sin and abomination. Level after level, layer after layer, selfishness, sin, abomination in an ever-increasing and offensive manner. So, yes, prophet of God, it really is that bad. And as chapter 9 began, as we read today, so did the judgment of God as Ezekiel was still within the vision. So he was able to see from the Spirit's side, as angels were dispatched to to mark the individuals within the country who were opposed to the sin and abomination that the leaders were committing. These individuals were to be marked on their foreheads as a, a signal to the reapers to leave these individuals untouched as they enacted God's judgment on the others. And at this point, I have to admit that the book of Ezekiel is kind of like a, a graphic novel of, of sorts. It, it's intense. It's intricate. It's, it's otherworldly. I mean, there's angels with battle axes appearing, and there's a, an ink horn to mark the foreheads of the humble who sigh and cry at the sin of the city. And, you know, these observations aside about the vision, there is a judgment coming for every man and every woman, an unescapable judgment. And unless you are marked by the blood of Jesus, you, too, will perish in that judgment. A judgment much worse than just a swift end with a battle axe. A just judgment. An eternal torment. So surrender your soul to Jesus today and allow him to mark your soul with his blood extracting every last ounce of sin and replacing with his everlasting righteousness. Okay, what did we read in the New Testament today? We began yet another book in the Bible, the book of James, a letter from the blood brother of Jesus. Well, the half brother of Jesus, for Joseph was not the blood father of Jesus. But can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your big brother? I mean, how many times do you think James heard, why can't you be more like Jesus? That would have been tough, especially since Jesus never sinned. I mean, ever. And I'm sure that James was looking for some sin. I'm sure that James was desperate to find some sin, some reason why this golden boy wasn't so golden. In all his life, James couldn't find a thing in Jesus. But that doesn't mean that he believed in his brother. In fact, 
his brothers, Jesus' brothers, tried to get Jesus killed in John 7, trying to encourage him to go to Judea at the height of the opposition against him. And it says that they did this in John 7, 5, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, much later on, James came to the faith, and some think that this happened during one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, it says that Jesus appeared specifically to James. And we find out in Galatians that later on, James was reputed to be one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. I mean, even in Acts 15, it says that he presided over the Jerusalem council. And it seems clear from Acts 12 that even Peter deferred to James. So with all this background in mind to this book, think this through. No one was more convinced that Jesus was the real deal. You understand? He grew up with him. He saw no sin. And James seems to aggressively seek to respond to Jesus with an intensity and uh, authenticity that was rare. But you don't spend too much time leading God's people to find out that there are many that, that claim the name but lack that intensity and lack that authenticity. Many that, were, that would say, Lord, Lord, many that know the, the lingo that even read the word, but there are a few that actually do what the word of God says to do. So James is in effect saying from a place that's unique to his experience, Jesus is the real deal, guys. And if you say that you're his follower, then step it up and really follow him. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says to do. So that was one of the purposes of his writing. His other purpose was to comfort the persecuted believers by encouraging them to be patient in trials and wary of temptation. So patient in trials. Listen to how James encouraged the people of God in verses 1 through 3. James says, uh, I am a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So maturity comes from patiently enduring trials. Trials are valuable, guys. Trials are teachers. Trials benefit the, the patient believer. Now, granted, this is a bit of a quandary because we need patience to endure trials, but Scripture says that trials, the testing of your faith, actually produce patience. So sometimes, especially initially, especially early on, we just need to survive our trials, clinging to Jesus, not thrive, just survive. And after we survive a few trials, then our faith is tested and it's found to be real, the real deal. And then patience is produced because we receive a, a quiet confidence that God got me through the last trial. And so he will get me now through this trial. Now, temptations are a completely different story. And temptations do not come from the Lord. Listen to verses 12 through 15, which we read today. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he, tempt himself, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So both trials and temptations need to be patiently endured. And in order to do this, we need the Lord's wisdom. And that's why James talks a lot about wisdom, especially in verse 5, where he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, that's a promise to count on. God's 
promise to give wisdom when we ask, and he promises to give it liberally to all without finding fault. And I cannot count how many times that I have claimed this precious promise. Now, wisdom can come from God several ways. Yes, God can drop a, a word of wisdom straight from the throne of grace right into the middle of a moment of intensity and need, but most often wisdom is gained by hearing the word of God and then doing what it says, and then doing that over and over and over again, gaining wisdom through experiencing the faithfulness of God through his word, through obedience, through trusting God and obeying his word. And knowing this personally, James says in verses 21 through 25, therefore lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his face in a mirror, for he observes himself and then he goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. <laughs> 